Hi, time to get started on this module, which is Connectionism and Dynamical Systems. In this first unit, we are going to start with a historical introduction, as usual, because it's very important to know where the models, concepts that populate a particular field come from. So we're going to begin with a prehistory, as it were, of connectionism. Connectionism as a field, the field of artificial neural networks, arises after the Second World War. And it then goes on to have a very singular history, which we will be occupied with throughout this module. Um, so we first want to look at what was there before, what was the ground in which connectionist ideas arose. And we'll then look at some of the early connectionist models from the 1950s, 60s and 70s, which belong to the first wave of connectionist research. Most of our attention in this module, however, will be concerned with work in the second wave of connectionist research, which extends from the, 90, from the yeah, late 1980s until about 2000. That's when connectionism was most important in developing theories of human learning and development. So that's where we'll be spending a lot of our time, and we'll be getting up to the stage where we understand how such models were considered to be of use in thinking about real people. The third wave of connectionist research, which begins roughly with the new century, will not concern us much. We will look in a little bit at some recent developments, but they are of far less relevance to our theme here, which is how have these models informed thinking about human cognition. Instead, what we'll do towards the end of the module then is we will look at um, dynamical systems, which is a mathematical framework. It's basically the mathematical framework of most of the natural sciences. And we'll get there from our work on neural networks when we meet recurrent neural networks, which are a class of dynamical systems. And then at the end of the module, we will have introduced an entirely different and current vocabulary um, used by many researchers now in addressing questions in human development. So we will have left neural networks behind at that stage. So to begin with, we need to understand what was going on before connectionism. And we're going to go back to the 19th century. The 19th century, of course, was a time of enormous expansion of the natural sciences, the development of electromagnetic theory, Darwin's uh, reintroduction of the human into the natural order through the theory of evolution. Um, we had the uh, effect of a great deal of work in the natural sciences was changing people's lives hugely, um, changing the very manner in which society is organized, in which, for example, uh, trade is conducted, in which warfare is fought, uh, in which uh, goods are consumed. Uh, produced and consumed. Um, and all this really only happened after the middle of the 19th century, which was around the time that theology and science sort of parted ways. Darwin is, of course, very important here. I don't want to oversimplify, but before about 1850, a scientific theory still had to contend with the objections of the clerics. And in the second half of the 19th century, Scientific work that made no reference to God or to Christian beliefs was possible. And with this, the, the discipline of psychology comes into being. And it's very important to know that this arises not by suddenly discovering that there's a mind to study, but rather taking many of the concerns that previously were articulated using the notion of soul and using a different vocabulary. But soul morphed gradually into mind and many of the questions that we still have puzzling questions about our own being in the world um, are actually continuous with much older um, questions that had been debated in a theological framework before. Now electricity 
was a huge innovation at this time. Uh, it had been found even in the 18th century that the application of electrical signals to um, inanimate muscle tissue of a dead frog, for example, could make the muscle twitch. And so there was perceived to be a deep connection between electricity and the very essence of life itself. This was a great puzzle at that time. And um, it's worth reminding ourselves that the novel Frankenstein was written at the beginning of the 19th century by Mary Shelley in exile in Switzerland because such ideas were not you couldn't express them in England. They were dangerous ideas. But it gives you a flavor for this uh, sense in which electricity is perceived to be the animating spirit that animates the body and generates, as it were, the soul. So at this time, science is beginning to move in and have something to say about questions which... Um, have been debated for millennia, questions about determinism, questions about free will, questions about the manner in which humans are or are not part of the natural order, are similar to or dissimilar to other creatures. These are all burning hot topics. And so just to get you going on this, um, we've got a nice article from the Journal of Clinical Neurophysiology you will find in Brightspace, um, which gives you a glimpse into the electrophysiological undercurrents for Dr. Frankenstein. Now, those of you who have taken my introduction to cognitive science class, which is most of you, but probably not all of you, will be familiar with the contrast that, has, that um, had emerged since the 17th century, early 17th century, in theories of the mind and of knowledge. And the distinction here is often cast as one between the traditions of rationalism and empiricism. These two traditions serve to emphasize different features of what we must assume is involved in knowing, whether human knowing or any kind of knowing. Within the rationalist tradition, most strongly associated with the French philosopher René Descartes, there is an, a great emphasis on the search for absolute truth, certain knowledge acquired through the um, offices of reason and logic. This is a highly intellectual characterization of cognition or knowing, which downplays the complexity of the world and the role of the body. And in so doing, it places great uh, it, it takes out a loan on processes of evolution because it is clearly obvious that a developing baby acquires very sophisticated capacities within a very short period of time. From a rationalist perspective, this is to be largely understood because the baby is born with certain biological structures, as we would now say. So this is the nature side of the nature-nurture equation. Um, and innateness is a key concept here. That is, innateness refers to those specific capacities that might be assumed to be inherent in a newborn infant, independently of its embedding in the world, of its cultural context, and so on. As against that, the empirical tradition, most commonly associated with the Englishman, Irishman, and Scotsman, um, the Englishman is John Locke, the Irishman is Bishop Barclay, George Barclay, and the Scotsman is David Hume. Um, these, emphasizes, these emphasize the role of the senses, of active being in the world, um, so the nurture side of the nature-nurture dichotomy. And when we factor in the role of the senses in gaining knowledge and acquiring knowledge and mastery of the world, Knowledge then appears as something quite distinct from the way it appears to a rationalist. It is necessarily finite and approximate, and knowledge can always be changed by subsequent experience. From an empirical point of view, the complexity that we find in a mature adult individual has arisen not because it was there as a potential in the baby, but because the 
baby and the world each contribute in a sort of a reciprocal dance through from which complexity emerges. And we'll see that this contrast is very relevant when we try to understand how connectionist models are um, used in studying human development. What we'll see is that connectionism made its entry, uh, as I said, after the Second World War, but the second wave of connectionism that we'll be particularly concerned with spoke directly to these concerns that had long occupied the philosophy of mind between rationalist and empiricist conditions. The underlying question is to what extent the complex capacities of a developed mind should be understood as pre-given or built in from the start, and to what extent do they reflect the emergence of complexity between a general process of interaction between the embodied person and the world. So as we see someone growing in development, Questions everyone has had all along are, are we looking at the unfolding of pre-existing structures? Are we looking at the sculpting of biological raw material by the world? Those would correspond more or less to the rationalist and empiricist extrema. Or are we looking more at the dance between two partners? And if so, how should we understand this dance? To what extent should we attribute um, built-in, uh, capacities um, as being responsible for the emergent complexity or to what extent is this a product of the dance between body and world. And the remarkable thing that connectionism brought to this at a time in the early 80s when rationalist, highly intellectual approaches to human being and knowing in the world were uppermost was it gave a new way to trade off these relationships. So you're familiar with the term artificial intelligence. The very notion of intelligence itself as some kind of pristine quality is a rationalist fantasy. This is something that there is no definition of intelligence that can make anybody happy. But it has at certain times played the role of the God-given nature of man and connectionism comes on the scene at a time when such rationalist ideas are current and when artificial intelligence is indeed born as a concept. And what we see in connectionist modeling is that we get to trade off the relative complexity of the world and the system in a modeling context. So looking at this illustration, which is taken from a platform we won't be using called SimBrain, the left-hand panel shows a neural network, which will stand for the system or, by analogy, the person. And we'll have to be very careful about the analogies we draw. The middle panel, data that this network computes over are obtained from. In this case, it's a toy world with mice and obstacles. So the data that the network processes have to do with the position of the various elements in this world. And in training this, then the right-hand panel shows some analysis. We don't need to go into any details here, but this is the place at which connectionist research becomes relevant to questions of philosophy of mind and provides, furthermore, a means for scientists to trade off these two poles, the complexity of the world, the complexity of the system, and the specificity of the learning relationship. And we'll explore all this in some detail as we go along.